Hi everyone, everywhere, here and around the world. I have my Yoda kitty, Fluffy. I sometimes feel like we communicate telepathically, and don't you love that feeling when you can talk with your cats or your dogs or your pets, and they can understand some English, but sometimes it just seems like we link in mind to mind, and it's so fun, and tonight, he just kind of stood like, yeah, I'm ready to be picked up. And so here is Yoda Fluffy. Before we dive into a very, very interesting story now about the possibility of finally confirming at least the possibilities of proof of life signatures somewhere else in our universe. And so two weeks ago, NASA announced at a March 16th, 2022 press conference that the first astronomical targets that the James Webb Space Telescope will see might be in June or July of 2022. Quote, these targets have been chosen for the super secret first images that will be released, close quote. Well, why would publicly funded NASA start off with super secret targets at the very beginning of showing Earth humans the sharp eyes that Webb will have on this universe. During the March 16, 2022 NASA press conference, Jane Rigby, the operations project scientist for the Webb telescope announced, quote, we've selected more than a full year of science. Those targets, those programs have been fully specified but yes, the targets have been chosen for the super secret first images that will be released, close quote. One solar system that NASA has already highlighted in its own March 6th, 2022 news release, just the beginning of this month, is, quote, exploring alien worlds with NASA's Webb Space Telescope, TRAPPIST-1 system, close quote. With this headline and beautiful NASA illustration, NASA is implying that one of the upcoming web targets will be focusing on the TRAPPIST-1 solar system that contains seven Earth-sized planets. In the red circle of the Aquarius constellation on this star map, 39.46 light years from Earth. In the interstellar neighborhood map, that I have been sharing with you the past few months, at the center is our sun and earth solar system, surrounded by other suns where I have noted other intelligent life that has been identified for me by military, science, and aerospace whistleblowers. This moving line from our earth solar system to the TRAPPIST-1 system takes us to Fomalhaut, and then another 20 light years to the right, going a bit beyond Earth's stellar neighborhood to the TRAPPIST-1 ultra-cool red dwarf that is not visible in small telescopes. But the James Webb Space Telescope should be able to see the TRAPPIST-1 star and its seven Earth-sized planets. Several are in the habitable zone of the star, and at least three could have water and land similar to our Earth beginning with this planet called 1E, 
located in the habitable zone of the TRAPPIST-1 solar system, next to planets 1F and 1G. All three, E, F, and G, might have a lot of water. According to simulation of magma-ocean atmosphere interaction, TRAPPIST-1F is a rocky planet likely to retain some of its primordial steam atmosphere from the first stages of evolution and today could have a thick ocean covered by atmosphere rich in abiotic oxygen. TRAPPIST-1G is also in the habitable zone with perhaps a thick atmosphere lying over icy, rocky surfaces and could have a thick ocean covered by atmosphere containing a lot of abiotic oxygen. This illustration shows the actual size comparison between our large yellow Earth sun and the much smaller, ultra-cool red dwarf TRAPPIST-1 star. The faint red dwarf has only 11% of the diameter of our Earth sun and is much redder in color. The TRAPPIST-1 solar system was only discovered six years ago in 2016. It was named after one of the telescopes that studied it, called the Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope, which is T-R-A-P-P-I-S-T, and then they add dash one. Scientists report that the seven TRAPPIST-1 planets are all rocky, and at least two of the seven are similar to Earth's mixture of water and land. All seven TRAPPIST-1 planets orbit very close to their red dwarf sun that is much smaller than our Earth's sun. NASA reported on March 6, 2022, in SciTechDaily.com, quote, Astrobiologists from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center are excited about this system because TRAPPIST-1 is a perfect laboratory for studying habitability, the area around a star where it is not too hot and not too cold for liquid water to exist on the surface of planets. We want to search for biosignatures in the atmospheres of the potentially habitable TRAPPIST-1 planets, close quote. And that means searching for life with spectroscopy, studying how light interacts with various molecules in distant planet atmospheres. If the TRAPPIST-1 solar system is near the top of the list of James Webb Space Telescope targets to study, but NASA is keeping first targets super secret, then I thought, why not ask one of the best controlled remote viewers I know Buddy Bolton in the Bronx, New York. There he works as Psychic X helping police find missing people, and he also does healings. His email, and he welcomes you to contact him, is alienprotocols, all one word, at gmail.com. Buddy's remote viewing skills have been hired by government intelligence agencies to remote view UFO-related phenomena where his accuracy with seeing targets is extremely high. So I asked Buddy what he could learn by remote viewing the TRAPPIST-1 solar system. Here now are Buddy Bolton's remote viewed impressions that he described to me on Monday, March 28th, along with his illustrations of what he was seeing in his mind's eye. I had four Earth-like habitable planets with water and that this experience for me was a very clear signal, very vivid experience. These planets also have moons, and this system that's blossoming with life. So number one, this is the one closest to the sun. It is a rocky planet with some water, maybe one-fifth to a quarter of the planet had water on it. It has two moons, and one of the moons has an active volcano on it. Also, it has life in a very small scale. And number two has one moon. I have it as being earthy. And when I say earthy, it has to have soil and dirt. And soil and dirt come from the processes of life forms, plants and microbials. So it's earthy. It has water. 
I think it's around like one third or a half water, very much like Earth, and that there's life forms on land and in the seas. And there's more advanced life on the land and in the seas there. And I actually went into the sea in my mind for a little bit and was attracted by a variety of bioluminescent sea creatures. There's ice on both of the poles. And number three has a magnetosphere. And it has a strong life in the seas there. Very prominent life in the seas on number three. Number four has two moons. And I think one of those moons is an ice moon. And under that ice moon, there is microbial life kind of like our Europa. And here's where it gets weird. Between four and five, I saw a gigantic craft, a massive cylinder craft. And when I tried to gauge how big it was, I got a sense that it was miles and miles long, at least five miles long. That has baffled me the most. Why would a craft be so huge? I got biologicals on board. They are scanning the planet, exploring the planet, and exploring the whole system because there's lots of different life all over this solar system. Hmm. And I got that there are humanoid biologicals in the craft. I definitely got the sense that they have started to build infrastructure to start monitoring in a permanent basis this solar system, building factories, observatories, and different probes, different places to get the data from all these different planets. Did you get any impression of the physical humanoids that were in control of this huge cylinder craft? As far as I got, they were biologicals, and they were humanoid. I didn't find out if they were tall, wide, they were part of a coalition, or if they were Nordics or whatever, but I got the strong sense that they were biologicals. Definitely something I'm going to go back into and explore, but it was very bizarre that why would they need a craft so large, these larger crafts? carry a bunch of other smaller craft in it and things like that. But why one would need to be miles and miles long? It may be an indication of how important this system is. You can go so deep on so much of this stuff. This is a solar system. Um, just incredible. So I think the classified stuff that they're not going to reveal from the James Webb, the most classified, is the craft. And then the second most classified thing is I think there are going to be remnants of something that you can detect a life form in number three. That planet three might have intelligent... It would be chemicals in the atmosphere, unusual spectroscopic elements in the atmosphere that are incredibly difficult to happen through natural processes. And I think that is what might have been a classified piece of information. And to me, it's disgusting on a certain level that anything in space will be classified. <laughs> It's like classifying gravity from us. Or, you know, it's, yeah. it's really disturbing. And more and more people in power and positions think they know better what's better for humanity. And they're handicapping us. They're handicapping our children. They're drawing up their dreams, their imagination. It's terrible. I'm stunned. I can't believe that they're classifying images and data. It makes no sense. Exactly. They had this inertial energy of enthusiasm from the public around the planet for what is the Webb telescope going to see. And then they get down to March with the idea that they're going to start showing people what the Webb can see by June and July, and then follow up with an announcement that the first images all categorized and ready for them to look at from here until December Unbelievable. First images are classified and will not be shared with the public. And that's why I came to you to do a remote viewing to see what you might sense in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system. And I think I was suspecting that there might be advanced humanoids, but so far, humanoid biologicals you only associate with the big five-mile-long craft. Yes, but there is, just because it's not humanoid doesn't mean that planet number three's advanced ocean life cannot be more intelligent than us with higher technology than us. And also, I want to throw one more important thing in. I think, I felt this in my bones, that the Webb telescope will detect life. Webb will detect life, the hallmarks of life. They won't report any craft until the government allows them to report craft, but they will see the hallmarks of life in different atmospheres of planets 
and outside of just the fact that their composition is suitable to life in the habitable zone. Great, as we understand that. But I think it will ultimately make that announcement at some point in the next five years. It's a very powerful telescope. NASA reported back in 2016 and 2017 when this series of seven planets were first discovered, TRAPPIST-1 sets a new record for the greatest number of habitable zone planets ever found around a single star outside our solar system. Wow. Maybe that's why there's a giant craft there, because it's such a blossoming, fertile solar system. It makes sense. And who are the humanoids associated, the biological humanoids with the craft? If you can get a sense of what they look like, what they have as an agenda themselves, I don't know if you can, but those are the kinds of things I would love to know there. And then if I'm summing up correctly, that of the seven planets in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system, it is planet number three that you feel this overwhelming energy from all kinds of life forms, even if there aren't like humans there, that there is all kind of life on planet three in the TRAPPIST-1 system. And also planet number two, planet two and three. Two is the one that has a bunch of the insects and the pseudo-dinosaur type creatures and the bioluminescent sea creatures. But number three has the most advanced intellectual creatures that have transformed their environment. I just had it as unknown biological humanoid craft is studying the system. I wonder if it could be advanced humanoid scientists like the Tall Whites who need a huge five-mile-long craft because they are collecting samples of every life form in the TRAPPIST-1 system. I think you nailed it. I think that sounds really logical. Information is power. Knowledge is the most valuable thing in the universe. It's more valuable than gold or diamonds. Knowledge is power. And I would think advanced civilizations, all of them, whether they're robotic or biological, they'd be on this mad dash for the most data and information possible because that would break down the physics and the rules of this universe and that they would have more control and command of everything around them. I think you might have just nailed it there with your natural intuitive sense. But he did do more uh, remote viewing to concentrate on sensing what type of biological humanoids were in the massive five-mile-long craft orbiting between TRAPPIST-1's Planet 4 and Planet 5, and why was it there? So next week, we are going to continue with Part 2 about this TRAPPIST-1 solar system where Buddy Bolton is convinced There is all kinds of life. And when will we officially receive the news from NASA and others for the whole world to finally learn here there is other life in this universe? It is a question that just seems to have been beating like a long, slow drum for so long. But I hope you feel like I do in doing this work with Buddy It's as if we are just right on the edge of there is life. There's lots of life. It isn't necessarily humanoid, but whatever the life is that Buddy Bolton is sensing in the watery planet, he thinks it's highly advanced, may even be psionic, in which it has the ability with the mind to manipulate atoms and molecules. The universe is like opening up before our eyes in this century into a whole new encyclopedia that just is going to go on and on. And we just need to break open that first huge, huge truth. This earth, we humans, we are not alone in this cosmos. And with that, Ian, I would... Uh, love to hear the questions and comments. And to make a personal note, Brad and I are sorry. Uh, We had audio problems all day. Uh, I have a computer that has really been having problems. That's why we were late. And uh, sorry that a mic was left open at the top. But um, we try hard to not have these human errors. But it's part of uh, being a human, I think. 
and recognizing that sometimes we don't do things perfectly, but you know this is our goal, is to try to do them perfectly, even if they don't always work. So with that, Ian, thank everybody for allowing me to go a little late because of all our audio and technical problems. But what have we got? Questions and comments? Well, first of all, Linda, thank you for that presentation. And we understand about the technical uh, problems that you've been having. First of all, I uh, want to congratulate you on passing another um, milestone, 203,000 subscribers <laughs> just as we went live this evening. Oh, thank you, everybody. It means a lot because it means that there is genuine interest in our coming together on Wednesday nights and having this dialogue after uh, I have gone out to try to find new information and bring it back to you and then to find out your questions and comments. It's a wonderful, wonderful dynamic. I just cannot thank you enough. So 203,000. Let's keep going, you guys. Oh. Let's remind everyone to hit that uh, yeah. subscribe button and also hit the like button yeah. too. Thank you. Okay, Linda, we've got people checking in from all over uh, the United States and Canada. They're calling in uh, and in the chat today from the UK, Scotland, Sweden, Netherlands, Israel, Puerto Rico, Bahamas, Chile, Bosnia, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So, yes. Oh, and tonight. I love hearing that we have people from around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in this time when we are all worried about what is going to happen on our planet in any given country, given the completely unstable political nature now, I hope that you might share my feeling that if we could start diverting to uh, let's say the web is going to show maybe something that will be in the spectroscopic side, which is hard data, and that the spectroscopic material that it sounds like from Buddy, if they can start putting headlines, we are not alone. We have found life. It doesn't have to be humanoid. This, ladies and gentlemen, we are so close to the revolution that we all been so impatient for it to finally happen. Life, life on at least two planets, maybe more, in one solar system, 39 point and a half almost light years from Earth. But this is the biggest deal. We're talking about scientific proof of other life on other planets. I hope that is the energy, an exciting energy, that could start to transform some of our planet. And I'm so, so happy that we have this Wednesday night together to keep going and helping each other keep going in this difficult time on Earth. And with that, Ian, I would love to know what people are saying tonight about Buddy's fascinating remote viewing of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Your audience are with Buddy. They were uh, pleased to see him making another appearance. And also one of her comments in the chat said that they, they uh, trust Buddy more than they trust NASA. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I absolutely. Buddy is the real deal. He has a gift. Uh, he has the ability. Uh, we were talking, uh, and I think it was last night on the phone. He literally was describing that he wanted to see what it felt like to go into that water, and I think it was on planet three. And that he can, which is part, I guess, of the remote viewer gift, that he can extend, he can make his mind go. And literally, he was talking about what it was feeling like to go into the water and the temperature and seeing all of the bioluminescence and how beautiful and strange all at the same time. And it isn't like describing something in a book. He's in it. He's there. He is describing as we would be describing real interaction with matter. But Buddy is going there by mind. And I think he is also aware that there probably are other intelligences there and elsewhere. And they are doing the same thing. And then you're into this whole issue of a universe that if we were more advanced, we would be able to extend our minds into many places. 
to pick up information and resonate. And that eventually in the evolution of Homo sapiens sapien, it is this kind of new understanding as uh, has been written by physicists, that if the universe is conscious and we are consciousness in it, then what Buddy and remote viewers doing are doing is resonating in a way in their minds that maybe all of us could do at some point in some evolution of our mind, but that they can do it now better. And I think about that, extending and diving down into the water of another planet 40 light years away, feeling and sensing. That's what Buddy is doing. So what have we got next, Ian? Linda, Betty Andreas and Luca passed on recently. Could you please share your thoughts about Betty's contact experiences and the time that you spent with Betty discussing her case? I only met her once. Uh, we had many phone discussions and dialogues, and I, uh, I just cherish the books about her experiences. Uh, everything from the Betty Andresen, Volume 1 and 2, was the first book that convinced me that the abduction syndrome was reality. And then going on into Watchers 1 and 2, that her ability to illustrate what she was experiencing, like Buddy illustrates, Betty was... Uh, a natural artist who drew everything, reading her books and looking at her illustrations as an abductee is quite an experience. And the uh, one meeting, it was with uh, Kenneth Ring, who was a psychologist who had read Moving Toward Omega. And it was a book in which he was comparing all of the traits and characteristics of people in the human abduction UFO syndrome with people who had near-death experiences. I believe that he was the first published author making that parallel. And all of us ended up at a conference and we went to lunch together and Betty was sitting across from me and her husband and Ken Ring and me. And we were getting into a particular question I think that I had, if I'm recalling this, in uh, one of the first two books, uh, the Betty Andresen affair, she did a, uh, like the Phoenix bird rising. And she experienced it as something that if she was five foot two, that this was something she encountered and it seemed to go up for maybe 30 feet, 50 feet. And I was asking her, because I was always puzzled about why would this huge phoenix bird be part of an experience of someone who was a human from Earth interfacing with non-humans that in her case started out as AI, it was clearly artificial intelligence grays that had the ability to move through the molecular structure of the front door of the house and that she watched it happen and she drew it. It's in the book. Her books are illustrated better than, than uh, most. They're just incredible. And so that was her first meeting with the AI and they froze, the AI grays, paralyzed and froze her family, her father, her mother, her husband, her children. And they left Betty in a state of paralysis but with consciousness. And that's how she could draw what she saw. And she was aware she wanted to galvanize her family. She didn't know what was happening. But even in her ability to be conscious, she was not uh, able to wake anybody up or make sounds. By the time that you go through many of her experiences, you begin to understand, and Be the Betty Andresen case, I believe the first book was uh, released in 1979, the same year that I began A Strange Harvest, because I have a, a 
movie coming into my own mind that it was around Christmas time that I was reading uh, the first volume and was so impressed and that as you go into volume two, at that time, my confusion about who, what was doing the animal mutilations was paralleling along everything I was reading, everybody I was talking to. And I'm looking at this illustration of the greys coming th right through her, the wood door and thinking, are these biological? What is this? And thinking of cowboy type people that I had interviewed that fall who had actually seen uh, in one case, it was two gray beings rise up in the air and come over a uh, fence that was around a corral. So my mind was uh, resonating with two completely different phenomena, but with some of the same descriptions and similar beings, which is why as you evolve through her first volume and second volume, she ends up having powerful, spiritual, deep experiences with beings that are extremely tall and they are pale colored and ha they have hair that is very pale. Are they the tall whites? Are they something else? We, at this lunch, some of what I just said was sort of the background around my question about the phoenix, and that a rising phoenix carried with it at the implication of something going to the heart of souls struggling in reincarnative cycles and the rise of the phoenix. And Betty made a fist and she went, that's how I just hit the table in front of me. She hit the table in between her and me. Linda, the key, the key is in our very blood. And I said, what do you mean? Do you mean that we are genetically made by them, but, but which ones have made us? And she and Ken Ring then took over the discussion that was fascinating that the moving toward Omega, the, the parallel between the near-death experiencer, what they wrote, what they said, and the people in the abduction were so similar that in his book, which is what we were talking about that lunch and Betty's experiences, that near-death experiences and abduction experiences and the people who had them had so many similar characteristics. And that was her bottom line reaction. It is in our very blood and that there is a key to the abduction syndrome appears to have a genetic relationship to other beings that we still don't understand and we don't fully understand the goals, but that it is that day at lunch that was a long time ago, but I think, it's, uh, the, I think it applies now. That genetic evolution by genetic manipulation, by advanced intelligences, mixing and matching genes on planet Earth, on a Trappist planet, on Mars, on Proxima Centauri solar system, out into serious all that everywhere if we knew the truth life and the manipulation of genetic material by advanced beings for reasons that are incomprehensible to us seems to be one of the major themes of this universe and if the final ingredient of it all that the whole thing is taking place like a huge theatrical production. It is for the education and the evolution of the soul 
that is gathering all of these different layers of information through so many different lives in so many different types of containers and is recycling it back to a divine field. If Betty were here right now, I think she would agree with that sense. And so that's how all of everything just kind of connects back. And I know that she is in another dimension, uh, another matter world, evolving. She was wonderful. I really, really loved Betty Andresa, Luca. So thank you for that question. It really reminded me of so many things. Linda, uh, one of our viewers from Australia told us today that Australia has announced it's starting its own space force. And there's a couple of questions relating to the large ship. Do you think the large craft could be our space force, say Sexy Sadie? And another question is, is the ship Dark Fleet ours or other humanoid? Well, it's like uh, opening up the next chapter in the book that we're supposed to go into next week. You will find it fascinating, part two, with Buddy on this. Um, but we, he and I, he's been doing some remote viewing. And as he says, you, you go in and he's done some fascinating material that I will share with you next week. But there's so much more to explore. And maybe after tonight, he and I will talk and maybe we'll dive into something else to share with you next week as well. But he, here is the big box, bottom line impression that he has as of today or tonight without going into lots and lots and lots of incredible details. We on Earth, as humans, we are constantly worried about whether or not humanity is going to survive. Will a nuclear war eliminate us? Will unstable climate end up destroying crops? That there will not be enough food? That there will be some kind of a solar event that might hit the earth and destroy, like apparently it has in the past uh, every once in a while? or that there will be an event that will cause a lot of flooding, greater flooding even than ocean rise. We're on a planet that it's very past that scientists study, leave us always with existential questions. And as Elon Musk would say, he thinks the greatest existential threat to humanity is artificial intelligence that will evolve rapidly and that humans will not have control over it ultimately and that AI will begin to replace humans more and more and more and you begin to combine all of that and that life, human life on earth could self-destruct, self-destruct. In the Trappist One story, so far, from what Buddy has been getting, is a fascinating parallel to a planet in which a civilization of intelligent beings can be doing everything right. They can be collaborating with the planet that we wish that we did hear more. But something happens, an ingredient in the atmosphere mixing with something in the environment becomes toxic. It is not self-induced self-destruction. That throughout this universe, we get examples everywhere that you can have a gamma ray burst. It would take out, it could take out most of a planet. And that what we will be getting into in the fascinating Trappist issue is that there may be very advanced civilizations, sort of like that TV show Battlestar Galactica, that are destined to be out in this universe in huge craft that provide everything that everything on the craft needs, but that the entire population is basically in ships that move 
maybe looking for a planet, looking for a, a natural matter state that they could inhabit. But if it doesn't happen, they have these gigantic five mile long mini planets that supports them as they come and monitor. And I think that another piece of this is that through the abduction syndrome, we certainly have gotten the impression of many drawings from many people in which the science scientists of whatever is the type of uh, ET, that they are gathering tissue, they are doing samplings, and that uh, as we ended part one tonight, the part of these big five mile huge mini planets, it may be also that what they want to be able to do is to sample a lot of life from wherever they go and that these huge craft may be sustaining populations that ran up against the catastrophe of uh, their extinction, but they were advanced enough to provide their exit in these craft and to be sampling from planets, maybe with the idea that the more they sample, the more they will know if this is compatible, would this be a planet that they could now take their 15 million people in these large, large city ships and put them on this planet or this planet or this system. So by having these uh, big mini planet ships, it gives them perhaps more options with less panic and that they are now in a position to choose and that they are choosing to study the Trappist-1 system. And there are more details that we will be sharing next week that are just fascinating. And when you realize that the CIA, NSA, DIA, they all hire people like Buddy, remote viewing is a real true skill. And Buddy is one of the best ones. And what he's getting, he always says, I cannot guarantee for anyone that 100% of what it is that I am getting into, I can't guarantee 100% that it's all accurate. But his uh, accuracy in so many projects that he has worked on, including uh, for Skinwalker Ranch TV and for government programs, programs and projects that he's uh, approached to work on. He is uh, considered in the high, one of the highest percentages that is consistent with remote viewers. And I think that means for all of us that the more you can go to Wikipedia and astronomy books and start reading and studying about this amazing Trappist-1 system named after an Earth telescope taking the initials of the telescope, and that the planets, all seven, would seem to be almost earth size. They say in some of the reading between Mars and Earth, and you combine it with Buddy's remote viewing and the idea that there is a lot of life, at least on uh, planets uh, three, uh, he thinks, and and then that ship between uh, four and five. Wow, I mean, if we can really start having space, uh, the Space Force be open and reporting to Earth what they're encountering out there, it could be a whole new age of Earth where kids want to go into space and want to be astrobiologists and mathematicians and that it could just be wonderful if we could get out of whatever we're going through now. Okay, Ian. Linda, I just want to uh, go through the super chats today from our generous audience. Thank Here you. Here we go. Moonbird, Zully Bella, <laughs> Higher Ground 0001, Marie Sapphire, Noreen Gold Colbert, Yang Lu in DC. Lilith Love, Linda Emeterio, Jessica Rodriguez, Diana Conley, Ethan Bent. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It means a lot. 
And thank you, Ian, for uh, being so wonderful an interface between the digital audience and here. Thank you. What else have we got in terms of uh, uh, people, are people interested? Ask if people are interested in this Trappist One, Trappist One remote viewing and do they feel that this is at least a valuable beginning uh, since uh, the governments aren't telling us anything? Is this a valuable beginning way to start getting into what we know is the reality that we're in a universe that's teeming with consciousness and life? Um, how do people like being able to see this through Buddy's uh, remote viewing? Well, well, we'll see what the what the reaction is in the chat, but it seems very favourable to start off with at, at the moment. We're also getting some reports uh, about booms that rocked people's homes and businesses across multiple counties in Indiana today at about 1 p.m. Uh, make sure I can get those. I've been collecting. There have been several in many different places. Um, I've been waiting to record uh, one person. And since they're increasing, I would say that this reminds me of uh, 2011 and 2012 when the booms were happening so intensely. It would be in a city and another city and another city and another city and then around the world. I wonder what could be happening now if anybody listening has any government, military, science, medical information about what could behind, be behind these booms that are shaking houses, there, some of them are being recorded on security cameras, and there are no explanations being given by any local authorities. Everything is being ruled out, the normal sonic booms and seismology. What would be causing all of these loud booms so much now, anybody who might have actual firsthand insider information, you can communicate with me confidentially. I would really appreciate any other information. Yeah, Ian? Yeah, and I think there's also some information coming through about another cattle mutilation. So if, if anybody has any sources, direct sources, uh, post them up in the chat. Let's have a look. Anyway, we've got some questions still, Linda about uh linda how do you think that the people who have the encounters with ufos are chosen i think it's genetics it's the betty pounding her hand linda it's in our very blood that's what she meant that is what bud hopkins and i used to talk about all the time that there was a genetic component and it depending upon what the we'll just call it the other intelligence, knowing that there's so many different kinds, there could be so many different priorities, so many different selection reasons, but that the key, as that's what Betty used, the key is in our very blood, genetics, the genetic complexity of earth. And then if you, if you marry that statement, with what I was shown out here at Kirtland Air Force Base on April 9th, 1983, when I was working on that home box office documentary and was shown the, do the document that said these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. What is left out of that sentence is how far back in time and which non-humans doing which genetic manipulation with which evolving primate that would explain all of the different evolutionary types. And we're currently Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapien. Neanderthalensis was before us in a crossfade. The other important statement that goes with what I just said is the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst in December of 1999, that would have been six years um, after, well, it would be 12 years, is that right? It, it would be 83 to 1999. In that distance between hearing about, seeing the document and hearing the analyst tell me 
Linda, our government has proof that three extraterrestrial civilizations, he used the word extraterrestrial over and over, extraterrestrial civilizations have been in conflict over this planet Earth. This planet is more extraordinary than humans understand. It is used as a laboratory for mixing and matching all kinds of genetic material for making all kinds of life, not just humanoids. If this is a planet that has tremendous amounts of life, always has, and that these civilizations have used it like a laboratory, and they have fought each other over wanting to have exclusive right to living and working and basing on Earth. And that is the conflict between the three, which he defined as tall, blonde Nordics, reptilian humanoids, and a complex gray civilization that was both AI and organic. And that those three were in conflict with each other. And he said, our government have proof that they had been in conflict on this planet for at least 270 million years. Well, 270 million years. Maybe one or two or three were in conflict. And maybe it was the reptilians who decided that one way that they could pull the rug out from under the other two was to create an evolving reptilian population on Earth that became the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs dominated this planet for millions of years. Maybe this is how they fight each other. Well, did the Greys or the Nordics then bring the six-mile asteroid to the Earth that other government people have said the Greys could have moved it into another dimension? And they didn't, that that six mile wide asteroid didn't have to hit in the Gulf of Mexico and create the Chickaloop Crater. It could have been in the technologies of the advanced ones moved dimensionally and it wouldn't have hit Earth or time moved and it wouldn't have hit Earth. And the implication was that the DIA guy from December 1999 thought that this was a deliberate extinction caused by the greys to take out the uh, dinosaurs in this ongoing conflict between these three huge civilizations of ETs. And others that I have talked to say that the genetic manipulation on Earth goes back 800 million years. It becomes incomprehensible. It would mean that there have been civilizations upon civilizations, and we have such a narrow, tiny frame of time in human life. So what I think is absolutely true, Earth is a unique, precious, extraordinary laboratory for making life and that this planet is considered to be valuable by many that are not of the same species of life forms. And that on this planet, going back long, long, long before what is called Homo sapien Homo erectus, Homo erectus in Africa is supposed to go back only two million years, put two over 270 million, that was the expansion that the DIA guy was giving me in time going back, and others go back even further. So I accept that all of the genetic complexities of current day Homo sapien sapien, of different races, different genetic components, different bloodlines, is all because there have been these mixes and matches between competing non-humans. But having said that, and we don't have them at least face to face in our lives, are we at some very special intersection in time in this universe in which the non-humans that have 
been present on the earth in the distant past, chose not to be physically present or physically present for humans to be aware because they can be invisible. They can use camouflage that comes from holoforms. They can blend into trees. They can blend into mountains. They can blend into everything. So we may have been monitored by close up extraterrestrial presence going back centuries, but humans had no idea. It is in the 20th to the 21st centuries that we have waked up to people seeing camouflage drop right in front of them and a reptilian be on the phone in that office in Dallas with the daughter waiting for her father and her father's turned into something that looks like an alligator at his desk and scared her. And that was the Jim Mars uh, phone call that I've talked to you guys about. Linda, you have to call right now. And it was the daughter of the uh, man who flipped into a reptile that his daughter saw and scared her. How, how does that happen? What interfered if his holoform was so perfect? And, and how do you have a father and a parents and a household? How could that possibly be? You would be raised in a household. You would assume that uh, that you wouldn't have parents sh uh, shape-shifting. So there are, is, uh, there are huge categories of the ability to mix and match genes, play with physics, be able to manipulate time, pop in other dimensions when you get to a certain advanced understanding at the cosmic universe level. And some of these beings apparently have that. And we, we are just learning. And we are coming into what I think could be such an exciting time to get away from tribal warfare, to be excited every day on the news with getting live images, a newscast from Mars. When are we going to start having people on Mars? Elon Musk get them there and we'll have exchange news between Mars and the Earth. Those times could be coming and hopefully war ending on this beautiful, precious Earth. So, uh, Ian, it's at 8.45. I thank all of you for your uh, endurance and patience with our delay because of technical problems. Uh, Ian, if there is one more question, I will try to answer it in two minutes. <laughs> sure. I just want to uh, confirm some of our viewers have uh, responded to your question. Yeah. Uh, just Emmanuel says, learning about the Trappist system is like a breath of fresh air and new hope. Dr. Dolores Mize, Mize says, heck yeah, we want to study the Trappist planets. And BKM says, yes, Linda, very interesting Trappist information and what Buddy has to share about it. Yeah, and I think in general is how many of you uh, have a respect for remote viewing because you've read enough or you are coming from a professional discipline and that you know that there is the ability for the mind to get into resonance with certain concentrations no matter where they are, on the earth or off the earth, and that Buddy, like other remote viewers, like Lynn Buchanan and Joe McMonigal, and the list goes on, Pat Price, they work for the government doing this on a regular basis. And I'm wondering how many of you think that remote viewing in your consideration is a very functional, very useful ability that humans may be able to develop even more and that it would be not something to be put in the category of, well, uh, it's, it's not us going there and digging in the soil and bringing back a plant. That this is, in a way, equal to accessing information that would take us a long, long time to get to that point but that remote viewing is credible, 
is valid for the CIA, NSA, DIA, whether they will say that or not, they use it. And that, that's why I feel that it is not only fun to go <clears throat> into some of these subjects, but that, that it has a history. It has a history in our own government. And that's why I would love to know if there are people in the audience tonight who ha also understand that remote viewing is a very valuable facet to use in the challenge of understanding uh, is there other life on planets in our system and then going to Trappist is 39 and a half light years away and look at all of those planets and suns in my interstellar neighborhood map that I keep adding to. I'm finding that map really valuable. For those of you who, uh, like me, I use it all the time. You can go into my uh, work and you can uh, study that map and you will see we're in a very dense area and getting remote viewers to help us understand is something that I think is valuable to do with Buddy and I hope you do too. And let me know, for those of you who might have professional knowledge about the use of re controlled remote viewing now, uh, it may be in your own professions. And on that note, thank you. I'm so glad that we got solved enough the technical problems to get to the air and to do this show tonight. And I want to uh, say to all of you who have been coming to my uh, 200,000 celebration with the interview with Lou Elizondo and your great, great questions that I feel like in a way we are sort of binding ourselves around such an important word that seems so difficult to access on this planet today. And that word is truth. To truth, you guys. Facts and truth. Let's keep going and hope we're going to learn about the universe from real, real ships in the not-too-distant future. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>